all of you here. So I have a little public service announcement before we uh, get started. I read this week, read this this week, and maybe you read a little bit about it too, but I just wanted to make everyone aware that, you know, a lot of times when we write a check last year, we would have written like 12, 20, 19, right? Or today is one, five, 20. But they're encouraging you not just to abbreviate the 20, but do 20, 20. And the reason is that somebody could write another number behind the 20, like 2018, and then you're in arrears on that account, or 2021, and your check is extended all the way out into that time period. So if that doesn't make any sense to you, ask Candace after the service, she'll explain it all to you. Um, <laughs> but I thought that was really significant, and I just wanted to share that with you this morning, that for the, this year, we need to write 2020 on all of our documents so that we don't have anybody do something nefarious with that. Is that okay? All right. So this morning, I don't know if you have ever been in a situation where you're working on something in the computer, they want to verify that it's really you, and then an image something like this will come up, and there are nine things in uh, pictures, and they'll ask a question like, how many of these pictures contain a triangle? Well, I'm asking you the same question today in this. How many of these pictures contain a triangle. Now, don't say it out loud yet, but I want you to count through it. If it's got a triangle, then uh, then count it, and then I'm going to ask you for a number here in just a, just a couple minutes, okay? Well, actually, about 10 seconds. So, uh, we ready? Okay. How many of these pictures contain a triangle? Nine. Everybody thinks that? Everybody? Okay. All right. Well, um, that's, that's actually the correct number, okay? <laughs> And, <laughs> and I'm glad because, as weird as this sounds, we're going to be talking about threes today. But first, let's pray together. God, thank you for this time of new beginnings and fresh starts, for what a brand new year may mean to many of us and could mean for all of us. Would you quiet our spirits? Would you quicken our minds? Would you help us to hear a word from you that would be profound and beautiful and shape our hearts for the future filled with hope? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, this is the season of epiphany. Now, that's a, just a churchy word that means the time when the wise men came and delivered gifts to the Christ child. We've just been on the heels of Christmas and Christmas tide, and for this one Sunday and one Sunday alone, we talk about the fact that Jesus was given gifts by the wise men. So the reason that we've left the star here is not because we were lazy and didn't want to put away the Christmas decorations. It's part of the significance of the wise men coming and bearing gifts to Jesus. And we find that recorded in Matthew chapter 2. The story of the birth of Christ is found in two of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's Matthew and Luke that record these stories about Jesus' birth. And here's the part that tells us about the wise men. In Matthew chapter 2, beginning in the 11th verse, on coming to the house, they saw that the child was with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. This is speaking, referencing the wise men. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, I would submit to you that for most of us, the best gifts are the ones that are fitting for the person or the occasion. How many of you love getting a gift that is uniquely fitting to your personality or your circumstance or situation? How many of you love getting a gift like that? How many of you also realize there are times that somebody just picked something up at the corner store and said, here, happy birthday or happy anniversary or Merry Christmas, okay? And so um, we love it when we have a gift that's fitting for our own personality or the circumstance or situation. Well, believe it or not, these wise men traveled upwards of two years to come present Jesus with these gifts. So it wasn't like they just ran over to the Jerusalem Walmart and went in the store and picked up something off the shelf. There wasn't a corner Casey's that they ran into and said, I've got to get something for the baby over here. They had meaning and purpose behind these three gifts of gold, frankincense, 
and myrrh. And the first of these was gold. Why gold? Well, gold is a gift fit for a king. The common person had no need for gold per se. It wasn't the way that you would exchange your uh, commodities. But it was a gift fitting for a king. That should tell us something about who Jesus was and is. And then frankincense, well, that's used in worship of God. And so that was the second of the gifts that they had personally selected for the Christ child. And then the third, and they save the best for last. And don't you love it when you get the last gift and it's the best gift? And it was the gift of myrrh. And it was because he would die just like any other human being. Only he was the only unblemished human being. So that when he died and rose again, he then makes available to all other human beings the gift of life eternal. But the gift of gold fit for the king, the gift of frankincense because we're here to worship him, and the gift of myrrh because he died so that you and I might live. Now, isn't that significant to think about in gift giving and what the, and that, so these three gifts were significant about who Jesus was. Now, the strongest geometric figure in the world is a triangle. That is the strongest of our geometric figures. And I think it's just built inside of us. It's inherent in our nature to love things that come in threes. We're just kind of wired like that. Now, my daughter's very, very favorite Christian author is a guy by the name of Frederick Buechner. And he wrote about, like, what's my purpose? What's God's plan for my life? What's the design that I'm supposed to follow? And this is what he offered as kind of wisdom. He says, it's the place where God calls you to where your deep gladness meets the world's hunger. In other words, you've got it in your heart to teach and there are students who need to learn. And so that joy of teaching is fulfilled because there's a hunger for learning in these children. Or God calls you to the mission field because you want to spread the good news. And there are people who need to hear the good news. And so it's a connecting in that way. Or you're a mom who says, I just want to be the best parent I can be. And you've got children who need for you to be or your dad who's in the same circumstance, or you're this worker who wants to be loyal and wants to do your very best, and there's a workplace that needs for you to do that. It's where your deep gladness meets the deep hunger in the world. And so I was talking with a person recently and kind of talking about what's, what's your life plan? What, what do you see God doing in your life? And this is what this person offered. They said, well, I've believe that there's three priorities and they come in this order. God first, family next, and work third. Now that might sound very simplistic, but for this guy, he's living an incredible life because he's actually sat down and rifled through all the things that he has going on and says, you know what? I'm determined that to the best of my ability, I'm going to put God first. And then I'm going to put my family in there because then I'll be able to love them well. And then my work comes next. And you know what? That's a pretty good set of threes right there. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he had three simple rules that he offered for us to think about as we try to function in God's world. And the first was do no harm. In fact, I want to invite you to say it out loud with me. Do no harm. Harm. The second one is do good. Do good. And the third one is stay in love with God. Stay in love with God. Now let me say them one more time because there's not a slide up here, so I'm going to ask you just to write it over your heart today. Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. Are we ready? Let's say it. Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. Those are some pretty good threes, aren't they? Some pretty good paths that we might take as we consider the new year that's unfolding before us. Well, when Jesus grows up and becomes a man and starts his earthly ministry, he loves to tell stories about God and about people and how there's an intersection there. 
And so when I was a college student at Evangel, I was pursuing a biblical studies degree. It was my senior year. And this is so long ago, the dinosaurs roamed and we didn't have electric. I'm kidding. It's not that long ago. But we did go to school in barracks that were built in the 1940s. But this is like now the 1970s and, and 80s. And what the practice was in your senior year, you sat in a chair over on this side and all of the department of the biblical studies uh, area sat opposite you in chairs. And you dressed up for the occasion and they did too. And then they started firing questions at you right and left just to see how well you had done. And I remember distinctly, like we had the New Testament professor and Old Testament professor and preaching and counseling and and all, representing their disciplines. And the New Testament professor says, what's in Luke chapter 15, Mr. Downing? And I'm like, Luke has 15 chapters? (laughs) And and then I'm just kind of, what's in Luke 15? What's in Luke 15? And then I remember he loved to tell the parables of Jesus. So I said, parables? Now, they were looking for a little more than that from a senior student. It was only part of the answer because it wasn't one parable, it was three. And every one of those parables had to do with lost things. The first was about a woman who had 10 coins. She loses one of them. She goes and sweeps her house diligently. When she finds it, she calls all of her friends together, says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. And then Jesus makes this heavenly point with this earthly story. He says, it's the same way in heaven. When one lost person comes home to God, there's a party. Second story. A man has a hundred sheep. He loses one of them. He leaves the 99 behind, goes out and searches for the lost sheep. When he finds it, he carries it home, calls his friends together, says, rejoice with me. I found my sheep that was lost. And Jesus, same way in heaven. When one lost person comes home to God, there's a celebration. And then it's the third story they were really looking for. A story about a man who has two sons. And this is what It says in the scripture, Luke chapter 15, beginning in the 11th verse, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divides his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Now you need to understand, we have a lot of people who make huge amount of money raising pigs and making bacon, you know, and who doesn't love bacon? It goes great with everything. But for a Jewish person, this is the most offensive job you could have because pigs were considered unclean animals. So this young boy hires out to be a pig farmer. And then look what happens next. He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. For the Jewish kids in the audience are going, how low can you go? I mean, that's the worst job we can possibly imagine. And now you want to eat their food too? And then I think this is the Bible's way of sharing humor. Verse 17, it says, when he came to his senses, and I would submit to you, the first sense that was kicked in was the sense of smell. And that's where he realized, this job stinks and my life does too. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. And he was lost 
and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Think about your favorite football team, and they just won the championship. Put your hands together and clap for them. <laughs> Woo! Because just as we celebrate that, even more importantly, Jesus says every time someone who is lost to God comes home, there's a grand celebration in heaven. And the significance of these three stories is that God loves lost things. More specifically, God loves lost people. And sometimes we've been lost in our thinking, and sometimes we've been lost in our words, and sometimes we've been lost in our actions, and sometimes we just don't know where to turn next. And yet in the midst of all of the beauty of this story, there is this understanding that God loves you so much he doesn't want you to remain lost. It's not for you just simply to find your way back home, it's for you to start back home. So that when you're even yet a far way off, you remember that the Father sees the Son. And he comes running towards him. And to that Jewish boy or girl who's hearing this, they would have gasped out loud. They would have, oh, men don't run in public. A father does. Who wants to say, welcome home, boy. And so does the God of the universe. He didn't have to come. But he placed us in this beautiful creation to be his, to pursue his heart, to know that he has plans and purposes for us. And he comes running to the heart that's open to him. Get the robe. Put some shoes on that boy's feet. He was dead and is alive again. He's lost and now he's found. And what a celebration it is anytime someone comes home to Jesus. Now, I was telling one of our staff or some of our staff that we're going to talk about Luke 15 as a part of this message. And they said, you know, over in the side margins of my Bible, I've written this kind of formula, three words, lost, found, rejoice. Lost, found, rejoice. Lost, found, rejoice. See, there's no shame in being lost. The shame is that when you're lost, who's out there looking for you? The person that picks up the phone and checks in with you? The text in the middle of the night? The person that makes their way through the crowd to say, I've been thinking about you, praying for you, I'm with you in that touch of you're not alone. The God of the universe represents himself as the father coming to the lost prodigal child. It made me think about these kind of threes, like thought, word, deed. Look at the first story. How'd they get there? Well, the wise men saw a star, and they're like, this is a different kind of star. That's a star fit for a king. And so the thought was, we want to see that king. And then the words, let's go over and see for ourselves, even if it takes two years to get there. And then they take the first step towards Bethlehem and the Christ child. They set out on the journey in the story we just told of the prodigal son. How did he get there? He's sitting there in a pig pen realizing his life's a mess and this is not where he wanted to be. He doesn't want to be there now. How many of my father's hired servants have way more than I've got? And he says, I will get up and I'll say to my father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy. But he couldn't even get all the words out of his mouth before the father comes running towards him because the boy dared to take the steps that would lead him back home. You know, a lot of people think that there were only three wise men because there are three gifts. Truth is, we have no idea how many wise men there were. I hope that doesn't break our Bible mind or heart, you know? But I would submit to you that there were more than just gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. I think the story tells us this. I think all of them gave God the best gift they had to give. And it's contained in that 11th verse. It says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, 
And they, go ahead and read the rest of it with me. They bowed down and worshiped him. I think that was the first gift they all gave before the gold and frankincense and myrrh represented. It was the best gift they could give because they gave the gift of themselves back to the one who was worthy of their worship and the praise. Let's go back to the original picture that we showed, the triangles. Remember that? Every one of them contains a triangle. You're right. If this was on a computer trying to establish our identity and information, you know what comes up next? One little simple line with a box next to it where you have to verify saying, I am not a robot. I'm not and you're not either. Now we're in a sermon about threes, and we told two stories of some kings who came and brought gifts to the Christ child. And the third story of the lost things, the lost boy and lost son. Where's the third story? What's well, your story and mine? It's how you and I are going to pursue God in this coming year, 2020. Whether are going to dare to believe and trust and hope and dream with God, whether we're going to let fear or sin or failure get the best of us. But I believe that you and I have a wide open opportunity to pursue this new year with the deepest of God's hope. And I can't wait to see what God writes in your life and in mine. When we add the story of faith, when we have the courage to pursue him with all of our heart. That's the art of the start. Let's take the first step towards home. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, great endings come from great beginnings. And sometimes we feel like our life is a little off balance or a whole lot off balance. Sometimes we've found ourselves in the pig pen of life and wonder if it could get any better. But God, in the midst of all of the beauty and the stories, help us to hear the truth that you aren't finished with us yet. You're just starting. And you want to lavish your love on the lives that are open to you and the heart that's hurt or the one that just doesn't know. And you keep on pressing into this world, shining a light, sharing your love, offering grace, forgiving and blessing. So God, help us to join you in the story that will unfold in our lives this year to not be reluctant to see your hand and your heart at work, to begin with a thought, God loves me, and to speak words of truth to our own soul and others in words of love. And then, Lord, just simply to take that first step or the next step with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to share in communion this morning. This is one of two sacraments that we as Methodist Christians follow. And when Jesus was at the upper room, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take and eat this, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. And after the supper, he gave a blessing to his father in heaven. He said, drink from this, all of you. It's the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is an invitation to experience and interact with the God of the universe who loves you this day. And so we invite you to come forward. No one's excluded. All are welcome. So won't you please come? And as we commune with Christ today, Please remember that where Anna's standing, we have some uh, gluten-free bread, if that would be of help to your experience. All are welcome. Please come.